Hello. Welcome, everyone. It's delightful to have you here. Um, I was just talking to Lee. Where are you, Lee? And uh, about George Eliot. We were thinking about George Eliot when we met together through Clifford. And she read Middle March just now. And she requoted the wonderful remark that I always love about George Eliot. It's, uh, it's say, it's never too late to become what you might have been. So I think I have a future as a basketball commentator. Yeah. Or player. A player. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Hello. No, but uh, he, he is a player. <laughs> thank you for being here. I just want to say that it's been an amazing, delightful time spent with Clifford, who I kind of met by Chan. I remember asking Irvin how, how did he meet Elizabeth Hartwick, and he said, by chance. And then a week later, I ran into Elizabeth Hartwick. I asked her, how did you meet um, Irvin? She said, by chance. <laughs> so it was by chance, in a way, that somehow Hurricane Sandy happened in 2012. And a year later, John, hi John, John must have talk to Jack, Jack must have talked to John, uh, because they both sit on the wonderful board of Motherwell Foundation, Dadalus Foundation, who've been supporting the rail for the longest time. And I think Jack paid a visit to my studio in Greenpoint, the, the rail headquarter there. And we have such an amazing time. And Jack said, would you consider curate the Sandy exhibit? Uh, basically, I couldn't say no to Jack. I said, absolutely. How big is it? He said, it's about 6,000 square feet. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. For some reason, it was turned into 100,000 square feet. So you remember the show. Some of you have seen it. So I owned to Jack. But the most remarkable thing was Clifford. Clifford came to the show, and, and I knew something was going to happen. Just knew it. <laughs> He was not being annoyed, uh, and he just kind of reminded me that my picture should have been included in the show, which is absolutely right. Hurricane Ways of Clifford Raw should have been featured prominently in the show. Uh, but they weren't. Instead, I ended up writing two long essays on Clifford, along with a sunny friendship. Why sunny? because we both have sunny personalities. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have mutual boyish enthusiasm. Uh, it's really remarkable, but I always blame Jack. Everything go wrong, go right, I blame Jack. Because why it's terrific to do so. Uh, I don't, <laughs> okay. I just smile. Yeah, I mean, we are almost like Batman and Robin. <laughs> Partner in crime, part-time lover, I don't know. It just go on and on and on. My point is that the show is so remarkable. If some of you haven't seen it, Clifford's show at Mass Mocha. It will remain there till April 17, I think. So this evening is really together, the three of us, talk a little bit about the work. Uh, you may have, you, may, some of you have probably read the, the extensive interview on the rail already. Some of you have not. So we're going to talk very briefly about how Clifford became Clifford. Uh, have a nice night. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, it, I quoted that George Eliot for a reason. It's never too late to become what you may have been. Clifford had to be a filmmaker, a painter, a sculpture, and then I don't know what he's doing anymore, really. Is he a hedgehog or is he a fox? Uh, you, you're the one who know him so long, Jack. You met him in 1975. I read your essay this morning. What was Clifford like then? Just the way he is now. He's full of boyish energy, enthusiasm. Um, the difference is that he has now become who he set out to become. 
Wow. Okay. No, it's Thank you all for coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, it's true because when I first met Clifford, he was, I mean, literally, he had just graduated from college. And I went over to his studio, and he had some really nice color field paintings. They looked a little bit like Frankenthaler, a little bit like Olitsky, a little bit of Hans Hoffman push and pull in them. They were really very accomplished. Um, and he evolved over the years. He got involved with doing actually very beautiful landscapes. I, in the essay, I, I talk about going to the Corcoran. Uh, for a while, I was an art critic for the Wall Street Journal, so I would go around all over the country to look at shows. And I would, went, I'd gone to the Corcoran. No, I'd actually gone someplace. I don't remember. Yeah, it was the Corcoran to review a Joan Mitchell show. And I wandered into a gallery, and there were these beautiful landscape paintings. I thought, these are really amazing. And I, I went to see who the artist was, and it was Clifford Ross. So he had switched completely. And this is one of the things that Clifford is really, was really good at, switching. And the thing that I admire most about Clifford is that he has the opposite problem of most people, uh, which is most people have a little, Max Bierbaum said, I had a little bit of talent, and I polished it, and I polished it so it shone like a big one. Well, Clifford has the opposite problem. He has an enormous amount of talent, and his issue has been, in his youthful years, focusing that talent, I would say. And over the last several years, he has focused that talent and produced an astonishing body of work. And I can, I, I can say it's astonishing from two viewpoints. First of all, it's very moving and very beautiful. But also, it's in a medium that I actually don't have a lot of sympathy for. I'm not, I'm not a big one for, on photography. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be so impressed by Clifford's photographs, just for myself, is really something. Because I'm, I'm rarely impressed by photographs. In fact, especially big photographs. <laughs> Because, <laughs> so yeah. honest, Jack. No, I mean, that's the truth. Um, John Elderfield and I once had a conversation. Do you remember that conversation? <laughs> and someone had said to John, photography is not an art, it's a hobby. And I'm ashamed to say, was it David Hockney who said that? And so right, that's what makes it even more to the point. And I'm ashamed to say I kind of agreed with it, even though David meant it ironically. I sort of, yeah. Partly because a lot of photographers I knew were basically people who did it as a hobby. Um, but Clifford's photographs are really astonishing and moving, and they're sublime. They also have a quality, the waves in particular, have a quality that's very rare. In fact, I would say unique in images of the sea that I know, which is that there's no humanity in them. That is to say, you really get the sense of the grandeur of nature without it being, except implicitly, compared to a human scale. And I realized that shortly after I saw Clifford's show, I went to Philadelphia to see an exhibition. And while I was there, there was a Courbet wave, a very beautiful one in Philadelphia. And I was looking at it, and I was thinking about Clifford's photograph. And I was thinking there's some, I mean, aside from the scale or the color, there's some essential kind of philosophical difference. And I realized the difference is that in the Courbet painting, off in the distance, you see a sail. Mm -hmm. And on the beach, you see an object, a piece of a boat, or a piece of a, in, in all of those wave paintings, you see some evidence of human habitation, therefore of human scale. Whereas in Clifford's wave uh, photographs, the hurricane photographs, there's no human scale. And they really are sublime. So, so why don't you say something about your, your work? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a good hobby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keeps you occupied, right? <laughs> yeah, it keeps me occupied. No, it, it's, um, I can't remember who I was talking to earlier, but it really is, it is interesting and really rather wonderful to be here because, um, as Jack said, we've known each other, well, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Fong is a relatively new friend. By the way, and your story about the meeting what was so amazing is I had not seen this remarkable show that had been put together. And Jack, you sort of castigated me and said, it's the last day Sunday I expect you to show That's up. That's right. And I, I actually had no consciousness about the show, except that it was sort of celebrating, in a way, the recovery. It was one of unity that was the artists whose work and lives were damaged, along with artists who were 
sort of supporting uh, their fellow artists who had been hurt. And it actually, it took me an inordinately long time to realize this idea that I was in a show all about hurricanes. I was walking <laughs> around with Jack, and after about 15 minutes is, is when it dawned on me. I thought, oh my god, you know, hurricanes, you know. I don't think I'm in this. And I didn't say anything to you no, until you what happened is he said, oh, you must meet the curator. And we were introduced, and my recollection of it was that you didn't catch my name on the first go round. And then a minute or two later, you said, what was your name? And I said my name. And you said, oh my god. So my recollection, honestly, the show was so fabulous. And thank god I wasn't in the show, because it turned into this amazing friendship uh, collaboration. And it's arced across, really, it's a 40-year arc. And um, whether it's sort of keep going in life or keep going in work, sitting here tonight with Jack and Fong is proof that it's worth it. Um, and it's sort of what my attitude has been. Um, when I started off when Jack and I first knew each other, I was born into a tradition of making art. Uh, and when you're born into something, it's inconceivable to you from that perspective that you're in any kind of a ghetto. You are actually in the world. You just don't know you're in the world that's this big. To me, it was the world. And um, you mentioned Alitsky, um, and uh, I was with Jules Alitsky's daughter about a week ago having a coffee, and we were talking about this world that we existed in mm -hmm. when we were younger. And it really was an isolated piece of the art world. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the path to getting to where I am now was a path of searching and rebellion. And I had to break free of mm -hmm. what was a very powerful world, one which I had grown up in. And the aesthetic really had me by the throat. What's interesting is that, that Jack is almost a singularity, I think, within the group of critics that were attached into that world mm -hmm. in that you really never, uh, you never followed the aesthetic, uh, the whole notion of formalism and, and modernism into a dead end. You stayed a free man. Um, the circle I'm talking about is the, uh, sort of the formalist circle mm -hmm. of Clement Greenberg, mm -hmm. um, a writer of enormous importance who taught me an enormous amount. But um, the searching took a long time. Um, I went through a lot of twists and turns. Um, and I think that the, the well, almost scattered nature of what I do even now, I move between realism and abstraction. I move from the digital world very much into analog, physical world. The, there's a restlessness that's still with me, but somehow it landed in a range. It found its own place. And mm -hmm. it only could have happened by evolution. Mm -hmm. You can't will yourself there. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely stunned to find myself involved making the work that I'm making. It's the biggest surprise in my life. When do you actually discover that real comfort, Clifford, have that comfort and real comfort with having this dualistic nature, the perpetual agony for most people would have been extremely discouraged. But you, on the other hand, seem to gain a certain momentum and be comfortable with that kind of fluctuating means that in the work produced and uh, generated. When, when did you find that? Yeah, the, the, the minute department? anybody brings up the idea of being comfortable, I assume they're talking about someone else because I, I certainly don't feel comfortable um, because my questions that I'm asking in my work are never answered. I don't really get to the spot I'm aiming for. It always ends up someplace else. But at a certain point, I think I just succumbed. I think one goes, oh, you know, this is what I'm about. And uh -huh. um, if my earlier art wasn't good, it probably wasn't mature. And I lived long enough, and I kept searching long enough uh -huh. that I finally found a certain way that was me. Uh -huh. And I stopped defending it, not only to, uh, relative to other people, but to myself. Uh -huh. 
Right. And I accept the fact that I need these twinned, they're actually sort of two axes. One is from realism to abstraction, mm -hmm. uh, hence seen and imagined. And the other is, is between um, physical things. I like physically building and making things. Um, it's a very important part of my life. But I also seem to like inventing things. Mm -hmm. And in the world we all live in today, a lot of invention can take place in the digital arena. Um, it's very odd that I've been sort of cast yeah. uh, in. I mean, that's another aspect, way. you know, Jack, about Clifford, um, is that the side of Clifford is very inclined towards technology. Um, i done the interview, so I sort of am familiar how he went to Yale, uh, studied with Bill Bailey, with knife drawing, with the great Stan Lauder. I don't know for some of you might remember mm -hmm. that name, Stan Lauder, who wrote an incredible book. It's called uh, The Cubist Cinema, 1970, arguing how history cinema had an incredible effect on modern art. And he was a Clifford professor. But then there was other people. There was Richard Barnhart, who taught Northern Sung painting, an incredible scholar of Chinese art. Uh, and then there's others. So all I'm saying is it seemed there was a, a seed that was sprout in that early formation. It might have taken, taken you another decade or more to sort it out. But it seemed there was a systematic effort to deal one by one. You know, it's interesting just hearing this because it's absolutely, when I went to college, I had no interest in art particularly, even though I'd grown up near it. And I certainly had no thought that I would make it or even study it. And college was like being in a candy store. And you mentioned these professors. And I don't know if anyone here knows William Bailey's paintings, but they're exquisite, quiet. They're like Piero della Francesca. Uh, you mentioned Standish Lauder, a name most people here don't know one of the crazy great experimental filmmakers. They were dialectical opposites, and I adored them both. And so early on in the experience of becoming an artist, really early on, I was thrown these different uh, ways of thinking, approaches to art, approaches of, uh, to even looking at art. And it's funny, across the whole spectrum, they all seemed legitimate. Uh, and <laughs> after I got out of college is when I got onto this track of that there might only be one legitimate way, which made no sense after about five years. Right. And that's when the rebellion sort of took place. Right. Um, but it, it's, it, it's all the different opportunities that get, I think, thrown in your way. Mm -hmm. You have to pay attention to them and then make your own stew from the ingredients. Mm -hmm. I, I remember... Um, in one of the long essay on your work early on, um, A.H. Home, where she described that at some point you returned to Long Island and you kind of took a swim. And you became very obsessed with water. And somehow, Jack, I bought a layer that great quote came to mind, genius is nothing yeah. but recapture. Childhood, recaptured, childhood. recovered at will. At will. Right. Yeah. There's something about that returning to childhood in order to gain mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. freedom, I, I would say. And then it became a huge subject for you, water and sea and land. And when I start reading Jack Reynolds' essay, he did mention Franken told a great painting, Mountain and Sea. And I was thinking about Mountain and Sea. Well, that's Clifford's subject. The mountain mm -hmm. tend to be more mediated through the landscape, which is, you can see, um, those realist, huge photographs that he able to do with great, amazing, minute details. And then there's a wave who, somehow take the other side of the equation. Um, were you conscious of those two <coughs> subjects as sustaining lifelong interest? 
Yeah, I mean, it really is funny, um, and especially with certain friends here. I've, I've come to the conclusion I just went into the family business, but more specifically than I imagined. You know, the books Mountain and Sea, I mean, it's like a joke. Um, my aunt's most famous painting, uh, Mountains and Sea, and here are these two books in front of me, and it really is sort of appalling. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm very aware of the dialectical nature of uh, the subjects that I've chosen. It is absolutely not conscious. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what other artists do. I, something, a subject presents itself, mm -hmm. and that's it. I know it when I see it. Right. Uh, and I go after it. Um, certain subjects turn out to be richer, mm -hmm. uh, deeper than others. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when I, uh, in 96, I read that there was a hurricane coming up the coast. I was in Westchester. Yeah. And I just thought, I just started, in fact, I think the friend Clark Winter who uh, lent me this camera, it was the first serious camera I'd ever tried to shoot pictures with. I had it with me. And I just drove from Westchester out to Long Island to see what would happen with the hurricane and the sea coming <laughs> together. And that was kind of that. I mean, the pictures I took were terrible. But the idea of what they might be mm -hmm. became, well, it still is. It's a constant fixation. Um, they are frozen moments of very dynamic forms. Um, they are in black and white. Uh, the first ones were not terribly large. Um, the mountain is its exact opposite. Right. Um, it sits there, it does not move. I had an impulse to photograph it in color. I don't know why, because I was totally uninterested in color photography. And um, the only thing that changes really is the light. So they are completely different, and yet they weren't completely different enough because each of them spawned a very deep investigation into abstraction mm -hmm. because I couldn't get everything I wanted from realism. Right. So I, you know, I, I can't, it's easy enough to look back and make sense of all this, but I couldn't possibly know where I'm going except maybe one day or mm -hmm. one week in advance. Mm -hmm. That's it. Huh. I mean, I remember seeing, standing right in front the huge mountain um, that were printed on wood surface right. with John actually and I was thinking about the monumental paintings from Huston River School painter whether Thomas Cole or others relatively speaking compared to the smaller hurricane waves they look as though they were uh, rider ass, you know, John? Is Albert Bickham rider? <laughs> Those waves as compared to the mountain that will be the opposite, Fredbert Church and so on. So it's very interesting to see that comparison because you talk about Courbet, which is true. In, in early aspiration, there was a certain conduit, a certain connectedness to the romantic European tradition mm -hmm. where the it go further back, but it, then it ended it with realism, which is where your reference of Kobe appeared, Jack. But I think at some point, Clifford identified uh, a deeper connection with the dark vein of American Romanticism. And I think mm -hmm. Albert Pingham writer seemed to be very appealing to you. Am I right, Clifford, or am I making things up? Well, you're making things up and you're right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> making things no. up in the sense that I think you, you're, this is your reading, but your reading is correct. I mean, I, whatever smiling demeanor I'm accused of having, there's plenty mm -hmm. of darkness that it's hiding. Yeah. And Albert Pinkham Ryder is a huge hero for me. Uh, I mean, he is, uh, he's our black period Goya. He is the darkness that's, somewhere centered in American culture, American soul, and it's just it's out of this world. There are other artists that certainly fit the bill. But Ryder, um, there's such power in these tiny pictures. And um, it's funny, the, the, there's a literary side to them, the story, like 
who's drowning in the boat, or mm -hmm. there's, there are all sorts of narratives hidden That's there. Right. I've never paid attention to the narratives. Mm. Um, I think narratives, for me, seem like a good excuse to go make a picture. And I know that's sort of horrific as an idea, but um, I, it's, I'm so aware of how I dismantle a picture when I look at it, mm -hmm. and it really comes from the, the background that I had. You know? Yeah, and then in Ryder also, the narrative, even though it's there, is not the first thing or even the second thing that you yeah. see. Absolutely. It's also, more than materiality. In, in relation to Courbet, one of the things about Courbet or French painting generally is that I think the sublime is foreign to French painting. Or it's French painting has very little engagement with the sublime in the way that American Romantic painting does or Northern <coughs> European painting does. Um, I mean, the, the, the only sublime French painting that I can think of, oddly enough, is, Cour is, is uh, Monet's London scenes, mm -hmm. the industrial landscape. It's kind of like the industrial sublime. But the natural sublime seems to kind of foreign to French painting. Yeah. But what about what, what about the the late water lilies? Do you, you don't experience to some, that. Yeah, to some degree, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not really that awe-inspiring sublime. It's, it's so interesting because to me, I uh, I drop dead in front of those great pictures, especially the second ellipse in the orangery, where right. you're uh -huh. totally immersed in his world. And I, I think of that as so related to uh, my experience in front of a great Pollock or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, which that sense read, of... Which Clement Greenberg wrote very beautifully, late Monet paintings. Right. He anticipate what's going to um, occur in Pollock's undertaking, I think, in that sense, the overwhelming physicality. But I, I also think that there are these the rapport, the admiration. When Pollock was asked, probably in 49 Jack, who among the American master, who you would admire most? And I think he, he said emphatically, Albert Pinkham Ryder. Right, right. And I think we were thinking about this rapport of the two of them because I always felt, looking at the classic of Ryder, the, let's say the Moonlight Marine, measured by 19 inches square, the tiny painting, but because he used such an unorthodox technique and material, candle grease, animal, animal fat, and so on, so create a different strange, which Greenberg again called the American Caroscuro. Remember, Jack? Mm -hmm. The point I'm saying, scale is psychological. You look at that immensity of space in the cell to silhouetted sailboat against that dark sky. It's almost the opposite of Pollock, even autumn rhythm, however large it is. I always felt that his ultimate aim is to in intensify the sense of intimacy. It's the opposite of Ryder. I'm just saying all this because I felt the intimacy is really there too in the wave picture smaller scale in relatively in relation to the grand monumental mountain photographs. But you know, even as you're talking about this, it's something you're focusing on, something that's interesting to me is American art and when mm -hmm. you were talking about French art, and I actually brought up the Monets because I think they're an anomaly. I actually do mm -hmm. find them the sublime, but mm -hmm. fundamentally the greatest French art really has a totally different sensibility and it's Absolutely. about something else. And one of the things I think in terms of any artist finding his or her identity, there are so many levels of identity, and this is true, hell, it's not just about artists, it's about people, but, but artists are meant to sort of, in their work, portray their progression in life, their levels of understanding or, or how they are identifying themselves. And one of the things that I think was an amazing discovery was in my hunger to embrace people like Matisse or Picasso or whatever, a young American artist is busy embracing people who have made great art but birthed out of another culture. And I think ultimately it really, um, and this has nothing to do with nationalism, it has to do with the scalability of life. We're all individuals, we might have partners, we might have nuclear families, it slowly radiates out. But it's, I don't know um, today, 
I spent four hours today with a Chinese painter who I'm very close to, mm -hmm. a man named Pan Gang Kai. And he speaks no English, but he is like an aesthetic brother. But it is wild to talk to him because the center of what he does, it comes from such a different place than from where I come. There's a point where we sort of kiss. But I think it's really interesting, actually, to, to think in terms of uh, uh, in today's this global society and all that. Uh, I have friends here from Brazil. I see friends from various different countries, Germany. And, and uh, I'm curious to ask you guys to what extent you think sort of national identity, does it still have the impact it had 50 or 100 years ago on individual artists? Or is it now lost in a sea of cell phones? I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's still very important. I mean, I, I myself, personally, I'm not a great uh, admirer of the whole notion of nationalism. And in fact, in the latest uh, presidential, uh, whatever they're called, debates, <laughs> clown acts that have been going on, there, the, one becomes almost repulsed by the idea of nationalism. But I think, uh, essentially, you're much more rooted in the place that you're, that you're born in and live in than you like to think. I mean, you're less of an individual than you like to think. You're really part of a culture. And I don't think that you get, I don't think that you get past that. Um, and I don't think it's something you, you need to get past. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and that's something that's, you know, one of the things that strikes me about your relationship to the family business um, <laughs> and the whole Greenberg circle is that it was like liberating yourself from a religion, which it was in a way, and something that I hadn't thought of until tonight. A lot of the Greenberg people were Sullivanians. I don't know if Sullivanians still exist, and if there are any here, I don't mean anything <laughs> to be offensive, but the Sullivanians, as it was practiced by the Greenberg circle, uh -huh. you know, this was a, a form of psychoanalysis where you rejected uh, your family uh -huh. in a very, a very active way. So it became almost a kind of cult-like uh -huh. uh, feeling, and, it's, it's, and there was this whole aesthetic behind it all. So, I mean, as I, I mentioned to you, I remember having a conversation with Clem Greenberg once, and I was saying, well, you know, if you look at Pollock's Autumn Rhythm, you can't help but think of trees. And he said, that's, that's crazy. And I said, no, even you, you look at the painting, and he said, that's a faulty way of looking at the painting. You know, you should, you, should, you should understand that. And I don't know if it was the exact words, but that's, that was the gist of the conversation. Um, and it, but of course, when you look at Autumn Rhythm, that's part, part of what's there, even in the title, by the way, in that particular case, is something like what happens with trees. Mm -hmm. And so that, that rejection was so strong in those circles, it's almost like the Sullivanian in, you know, imperative to reject your family, your parents, everything close to you so that you can become yourself. But you don't become yourself simply by rejecting things. You become yourself by loving things, not only by, not only by rejecting things. You do have to reject things. So and I think that's, that's one of the things that comes across in, in you as a person and in your work. One of the things also that struck me, as you may remember, when, when I was up at Mass Mocha to see Clifford show, I walked into the giant landscape painting, and I said to him, it's Fang Wan, which is very appropriate tonight, since tonight is the first year of the Lunar mm -hmm. New Year. Um, but you know, the, the, the great uh, Chinese painter, Fang Guang, um, especially the painting Travelers Among Mountains and Streams, mm -hmm. which is one of the most sublime mm -hmm. pictures anybody ever painted. And, those landscapes that you did, I mean, this is one kind of landscape. Could you hold this up? Because I don't know that everybody's seen the covers. Can I get this one? Mountains and sea, that's what we were talking about. I mean, just, God, this is killing me. I'm sorry. Call, it's call a psychoanalyst. Uh, but, but inside, there are, what he does with the mountains is not only the color photograph, which is really beautiful and sublime, of the mountains, but there are these things that almost are like Chinese paintings. When I first saw them, I thought he must have painted them. But they're not, they're actually photographs that he manages to make 
into that kind of abstract marking language that really is quite astonishing. We're trying to find an image we'll find we an can image. show it, yeah, eventually. Here, why don't you talk and I'll look for the image. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting. What, um, what Jack is referring to is uh, I took one of the more traditional photographs that certainly it's, it's ready aspect is its realism. It's very indebted to the Hudson River School. Um, at a certain point, I was unable to get the final elements of that scene and my reaction to the scene. You know, I couldn't put it into a form where I could give it to you. I felt there was, that's where there was a failure level. And what happens, it's like a trigger. Something happens and I reach for either abstraction or if it's not fully abstract, I, dis I dismantle the image. Uh -huh. And um, what have you got there? This is one of the small pieces. It's the yeah. harmonium? Yeah. yeah. So um, I literally began, I spent five, a year and a half making a camera to, to get the mountain. Yeah. Took a year to figure out how to make a print from that. Um, it took three more years just to make 14 photographs. And at the end of it, when I was faced with my failure to reach that final feeling which I had from the mountain, I began to tear it apart. And I spent, well, I'm still tearing it apart. That was uh, maybe 2006 or something, and 2007. So I've now been breaking down the mountain for eight years. Um, mm -hmm. Jack has opened up uh, this book to, uh, this is a, a tiny little, tiny little percentage of one of the larger uh, images, um, and I took it and I simply used it as a vessel for color. And given, say, my heritage and my passion for people like Rothko, Ellsworth Kelly, um, Matisse, I knew that color could carry the day. It could carry the weight of expression. Uh, it could give you content. And I used the, a black and white negative piece tiny piece of this vast landscape uh -huh. as a vessel. And in my fantasies, it was sort of like thinking of Rothko's clouds, uh -huh. where he had this cloud form or a background into which he poured color. And he poured them in combination that gave them meaning. I made 87 different, 88 different, called them harmoniums. It was the same image over and over, but tuned to really the full spectrum of color I could, I could make. Um, another thing I did is I ended up uh, taking this entire image, the, the large mountain, I turned it into a black and white negative and I printed it, the, the center of this exhibition really, uh -huh. was a print, it was 114 feet wide and 24 feet high and it was printed on wood. It was black and white negative and when Jack was referring to it as... Um, That's when I walked yeah. into the room. The it, big it's one. a very, very large image. And the, the thing is, the reason it feels so large is that you can't back away far enough from it. You can only go back 30 feet. So you really are forced into a confrontation with something that it is really big. If, it was, if we uh -huh. put it in the armory on 67th Street, it would lose something. Um, mm -hmm. It would lose uh, its continual force on you because you could walk away. When, if you walked away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, strangely, and when you mentioned Fan Guan, he was a, a northern Sung landscape painter. Um, the painting Jack referred to is sort of, if, if, it could, if you could imagine it, sort of the Mona Lisa of China. I mm -hmm. mean, that, that landscape mm -hmm. painting is it. Um, uh, and so many people that know Chinese painting, when they saw this in a way, it's such an, an American scene, and yet somehow it got transformed mm -hmm. into this other mood, something which really came out of a, a very different aesthetic. You know, I hang on to that thought, you know, of, of it being this American mountain, and yet it comes out as a Chinese landscape. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, talk about surprise. Yeah. Uh, it's very strange. Yeah. Well, I, I was really surprised when I walked into the room and saw it. Uh, imagine how yeah, I felt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like, but yeah. truly, the, the the process of the process of exploration, of trying to realize in some form, 
if there are filmmakers here or musicians or dancers, I met one dancer earlier, I know there's at least one here. I think artists and creative people are trying to make something which is akin to their own experience of something else. It could be a landscape, it could be a feeling from people, but they are trying to make real for you uh, something they have experienced. Um, artists who claim that they really are not trying to communicate, and I've had those discussions, I really don't believe them. Uh, I think they think they're doing it for themselves. But at the end of the day, it's our successful or not attempt to give to other people uh -huh. uh, some feeling, some view that we have. Yeah. And you know, it literally becomes, in my case, by any means necessary. I mean, it really well, is. I, I think that in just to follow up what you say earlier because about transnational, that kind of crossover, different culture, especially now, uh, Flamek once said something remarkable. He say, international is intelligent, national is stupidity, and art is local. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very yeah. insightful. Um, we don't. We're not going to carry this conversation too long um, because it's New Year party, and we want to drink and have catch up with our friends. But I have one last question for for you, Jack, and then see what he think about it. Um, okay. I'm thinking of Isaiah Berlin landmark essay, "The Hedgehog and the Fox," mm -hmm. about the two different intellectual artistic temperament. One who can mediate with the world in multitude of ways, but it had to filter through one singular vision. Mm -hmm. The others have diffused mind and to whom the words cannot be boiled down on reading whatsoever. So the first one is attributed to the hedgehog. Mm -hmm. The second is the fox. Which one do you think he is? Well, he's a little of both, at least. But I would say more the fox than the hedgehog. I think he's a fox, classic mm -hmm. fox, all the way through. Mm -hmm. OK? Is that OK, Clifford? There is no, absolutely I, I, well, no response okay, possible. So, so, <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. And I think it would be nice to, to get some books signed by Clifford Weiss here, and then we can migrate over the other room for drinks and food. And um, yeah, he's here for a while until those books are sold. It benefit the rail, by the way. Those, so just let you know. Thank you so much. So. I'd say he's too stubborn to be a pure fox. <laughs> <laughs>